Good evening, fellow Unselects. Whether you're a seasoned public official, a curious student, or a concerned neighbor, this is the show for you. We are not the elite. We are not the chosen. We are not the elected. We are the Unselects, the ones who ask questions, the ones who challenge the norms, and the ones who refuse to be mere spectators. We're not here to judge. We're here to understand, to ask questions, and possibly have a little fun along the way. I'm Greg Richards. And I'm Brian Costello. And we are the Unselects. All right, tonight on the Unselects, we tackle MBTA Communities Act here in Shrewsbury, Article 44 in the town meeting. So Brian, I think we've talked about this ad nauseum, <laughs> right? It's the, it's the uh, gift that keeps on giving, as we, as we should see. Um, Article 44, the, the select board has recommended it to be moved to the fall. But what we want to do is I think we should give people an overview again of what is the MBTA Communities Act, what's the impact of Shrewsbury, what's Shrewsbury's plan, and then I know we're going to go into some detail that we have a little disagreement with the town and some of the financials, I believe, we're going to talk about today as well. Absolutely. And I think this, as you said, the gift that keeps on giving. Um, we are not, it's, this is not going away. This is just going away for a very short period of time. If we kind of go back in history, right, this was a bill that was stuck into a, an economic appropriations bill at the end of, I think, a 2021 session, right? Large the omnibus bill. Omnibus yeah. bill in the, the legislature. It does have ties going way back, but for this sake, this is what it is. But in the actual law, right, it was only three paragraphs. What it initially said, right, was that, hey, you have to have a reasonable size zone, right, that's at least 15 units per acre, can't have restrictions on age, um, and it has to be located within a half a mile of a commuter rail station, subway station, or a bus station if applicable. Well, here in Shrewsbury, we're, we don't have any of those, right? So we're an adjacent community, so we didn't have to have the zone within a half a mile. But that is essentially, if I'm reading this correctly, right, Brian, what it says. <laughs> yeah, and there was only um, four uh, guidelines or rules that said if you did not comply, there were four types of uh, uh, state grants that you could not be eligible for. Um, these are generally not giant grants, and we can go through some of that a little later, but there were four grants. Um, that does not include things like schools or highway. Right. Those are all exempt from right. this law. Right. Schools are Chapter 70. This is the detail here. Chapter 70 money is schools, which we'll, we'll talk about as part of this. Chapter 90 is roads, right? Those are based off of town size, the number of population. Those, those you get no matter what. These are the uh, grants that are based off applying, right? They're, they're specific grants for special things throughout town. So the third part of this was, okay, we talked about what do you have to do? You mentioned what happens if you don't comply, which was, hey, you don't get these grants. And the third part is, well, who actually holds you accountable? And, and it's this, the executive office, right, of housing and livable communities, right, which doesn't sound Orwellian at all, right? <laughs> Not at all. And they actually are in Massachusetts, right? That's it's part of the executive branch. And they're the one who created guidelines and, and is the one who's holding towns are determining if towns are in compliance or not, right? Right, and the EOHLC, um, lo and behold, their primary goal is to build things. Right. Build exactly. housing in Massachusetts. The other piece I think we should touch upon, maybe you can talk upon it a little bit, is is it's as of right zoning. So when we say as of right, how does, how does that impact us? So as of right zoning in simple terms means that once it's zoned, um, you don't need a special permit. Um, to build. The, uh, a developer can come in, and as long as it's zoned in this guideline, they can build to the guideline. So, for instance, on the 1,500 units in Shrewsbury, you would zone to 1,500 units. That zone means that a developer can come in and build them, as long as they meet the compliance. There's very little compliance at the town level. The town can't stop this. There's some little things that they can have them do, but at the end of the day, it's very much like 40B, which is the affordable housing program. As of right means I'm going to be able to build this because you've already zoned it. So a little bit about the EOHLC, I think it's important to know. As you mentioned before, this is right off of the Massachusetts website, right, mass.gov. It clearly states their mission, right? Because initially, I think a lot of people, when we talked about MBTA, said, hey, this is just zoning, right? We don't have to build anything. It's not a building bill. It's just a zoning bill. But I said, well, then why on the EOHLC does it say they were established to create more homes, 
it doesn't say zone for more homes. It says create more homes, right? And an example of this is right here in Shrewsbury, right? Right on Route 20. This is um, the Pointed Hills Farm. It's it now changed names. The EOHLC, right, is the one responsible for this project of actually giving tax credits. There's $42 million worth of tax credits for that project because it is a 40B property. So it's 93 units and they got $42 million in, in various pieces, whether it was you know, deferred taxes or actual direct funding on behalf of it. So I always say it's interesting that you have an organization who's establishing guidelines to determine your compliance, but who's also the one who's responsible for doling out the money to the same developers to ensure things are built. And one of the prime movers of the EOHLC, when you look at the uh, the real details, uh, lo and behold, it's primarily supported by large development organizations. When they say we're giving funding to the town, the reality is that funding goes through a grant from the town to the developer. It's not going to anybody in the town. It's tax funded, both federal and state. So we are paying for this, whether you like it or not. So these grants are not, these, these aren't grants like sort of um, to, you know, put a bench on the, on the town common, right? right. This is, these, are, these are major grants given to developers to build things in your town. And these developers aren't from town. As a matter of fact, Wind Companies is a very large organization, just to give you an idea. It's, it's a giant company. Now, the guidelines that they had created, right? We started with three paragraphs and then they came up with 18 pages, right? So in this guideline, it, it goes into more detail. It says you have to have a minimum of 50 acres. It actually talks in here about you actually have to uh, establish what percentage of your existing housing units you need to zone to add. So Shrewsbury is an adjacent community. We have just under 15,000 housing units. So by this 10% number, we need to add 1,497 housing units. So for Shrewsbury, that's a big impact. But you look at a rapid transit community, somebody like a Milton, who's been in the news on this for um, actually putting up a vote to town that actually turned over a town meeting decision, 25% increase in your available housing in a given town. And there's 12 towns throughout Massachusetts. And that's a dramatic increase, right, in population potentially. The people, even though the select board voted for it, the people actually did a, a ballot initiative and voted against it. And the state promptly sued them. But what we're seeing now is a lot of other towns starting to vote against this same, this same act. Right, and, and I think a lot of that stems from education. Because when we've gone out and talked to people about it, most people don't even know about it, right? They're not paying attention. They're like, I've never heard of this. And then when you lay it out and say, well, essentially, it's going to allow us to build, you know, 1,500 new housing units and increase our population by 10%. And they said, what? Right? It goes back to the whole thing. Hey, we already have traffic issues. I can't hardly even get down, uh, you know, Lake Street or when I'm going to Market Basket. You know, there's all kinds of issues around that. And I think it's just one of those things where the more time people have to absorb it, and that's where I kind of feel my opinion is the state pushing this through these spring town meetings is that before people really wake up and understand what it is, it's already been passed. And I right. think that's what you see. So then at the point in time you start getting pushback, a lot of people start saying, oh, well, most towns are in compliance. Well, compliance by definition, right, is only submitting the right paperwork that says hey, we're working on this, right? We don't have to comply until the end of this year, meaning we don't have to have a plan submitted. It doesn't mean the state has to approve it. We just have to submit it by the end of the year. So our messaging was always, why are we rushing this, right? Why are we running you know, forth to try to get this implemented when we have so much time? The people that work for towns are oftentimes what we talked about on last show, bureaucrats. You know, These are folks that are just procedurally oriented. There was a thing they had to fill out, and so they filled it out, and they want you to comply with that. But what the townspeople have been saying is, wait a minute, filling this thing out kind of binds me with that as of right zoning to signing up for something I don't think I want to sign up for. Right. So back to the grants, because in the guidelines, there was additional grants they put in. So when you looked at the original a bill that was passed, there was four grants, like you had mentioned. But then in the guidelines, all of a sudden they said, wait a minute. I think what happened was a lot of towns were saying, well, that's not a big deal. So we're not going to be eligible for four grants. But then they put 13 other in here. And we'll talk about Shrewsbury specifics. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on this. 
because I think it's really important for us to talk about what are we doing here in Shrewsbury, right? For sure. So what is our actual plan? Okay, is the best we know. And I think we can talk on this because we've attended probably every, whether it's planning board meeting, FinCom meeting, we've done to the town uh, presentations. I think we met each other at the police station, yes. right at one of these for the MBTA uh, zoning. We've been on Zoom calls or Google Meets with uh, Chris, the planner. So I think we, we can speak about what the town is doing in our own way. This is on Article 44, and I think it's important to mention it because for the town meeting members who are watching, you still need to vote on this, right? And we're hoping that you vote no. Even though the select board has recommended it for the fall, you still need to vote no for that to happen, right? And in it, one of the reasons and things we pushed upon was the way that it reads is it states that, you know, the, the zoning article is intended to meet and satisfy the requirements of 40A3A. And as we have mentioned, you can't unequivocally state that this is going to meet and satisfy that based off of what other towns have done when it comes to the process, which we'll get into here. So our official status on the website in MBTA website for the state is that we are in interim compliance because we had our action plan approved and our deadline there is the end of the year, but we did not submit a pre-adoption review, right? And we'll see at the end of here when we uh, we listen to Beth Cass advance um, messaging to the planning board about pre-adoption review specifically, but let's give some details on it. If you go on to the EOHLC, there is a pre-adoption process that specifically is there, right, where it states, if you want to seek assurance, right, that your proposed zoning will meet the requirements before, right, that's a key word, before bringing to the local legislative session, you can submit a pre-adoption application. So for those who don't know, the local legislative session is town meeting, right? So a lot of the things that we had brought up was why didn't we take advantage? If you really want to do due diligence, this should be done. Agree? Absolutely. And what we saw is now about 177 towns have to uh, present a, uh, a zone. Um, of those, a good number of them have taken advantage of the pre-adoption review application and their zone was not approved by the EOHLC. So again, if they brought it to town meeting, what you're actually voting on is not the thing that it will ultimately be. It's actually a disapproved law. Right. It's a disapproved zone. I think there's only three towns that went through the process, Arlington, Lexington, and Salem. I believe you're correct, yes. Um, that actually got okayed through right. this pre-adoption process. The vast majority have not. And so by going to a town meeting before this, we're actually voting on something that is highly likely to be not approved by the state. Right, and we're not saying the whole thing is gonna be scrapped. And I think some of the comments um, from the town, right, whether the planning department or the town manager is, well, it's just a review of a spreadsheet and how we did it, but that's not really the case. I mean, I've looked at the letters. You can see the letters up on the screen here that these are, these are actual letters back when towns had submitted that pre-adoption review, right? I think there was 45 that, that done it. I could find maybe 10 letters, but every single one of these, right, is portion of their plan does not comply. And, to and give most people, recently, yeah. I'll use shoes, uh, yeah. Southbro as an example, right? Most recently, Southbro pulled back their vote specifically because they went through this pre-approval process. They had a consultant that guaranteed, no doubt about it, it was going to be approved and the state did not approve it. So they had to pull back on the vote. Um, so it's not as easy as it sounds when the town says, hey, we have an Excel sheet, which is basically what they told us. Right. It's, that's not enough due diligence. Absolutely, and we'll dig into a little bit more, but here's some of the feedback we typically get, right? It, it clearly shows here that it says, hey, based off what you sent, it doesn't demonstrate that you'll meet the requirements. And at other statements you see in there, hey, for those reasons, right, we recommend that the town address issues. Once again, does it say before or after? It says before, before putting the district to legislative vote. So this is the data that we had prior, right? And when we went and go talk to, whether we went to the planning board um, or when we've talked about it throughout town is, we're just asking to say, these are mechanisms put in place to, to ensure that at least we have the best picture in front of us before we're asking people to change our zoning laws, right, forever. Yeah. So specifics on our, on our plan at Shrewsbury, uh, minimum acreage is, is 50 acres. That's coming from the state, right? The capacity is due to, like we mentioned, 10%. The one part on here I'm going to highlight is 
the claim that because we have a mandatory mixed use section that that reduces our total uh, requirement to 1123 units well that's wrong all right and i'll explain why that's wrong um it's semantics but it is wrong because it, you don't really reduce it you just move it to another spot you still have to have it we'll show that in a lot of detail on the next pieces the one thing on mandatory mixed use going into this mixed use by definition is a mix of commercial and what's the other part housing housing right so it's not just hey guess what we got to pass because we did this mandatory mixed use it has to exist so if you actually look at it it states right here and this is from the state right so if you have 100 units in a zone and you say i'm going to offset by 25 percent in a mandatory mixed use yeah my one zone has 75 but the 25 are still there and it says right there it says look together they have to demonstrate the unit capacity of 100 right it's like a plus b has to equal c you can't just say hey guess what we have this other area and now we can get a 25 percent reduction and we're good no those housing units still have to exist somewhere and we'll, and we'll look at how that really applies in the town okay so the other part that's mentioned by the to allow a mixed use district you have to get pre-approval from the state now we have submitted it and it, and it does show it here that it says a, commu a community must submit the application and it has to be submitted before town meeting and i'm not sure that this was actually done 90 days in advance it may have been i'm not going to say that it wasn't but i know it's something we brought up right at some of these meetings to make sure that that was done and i think um in the next uh, warrant they said they would take that out correct they're so th so they are actually this was submitted by the town they're still waiting on feedback so we don't have an answer we wouldn't have an answer by next monday which, right so right now would be the 20th which is next monday so that does have to get done and approved for us to use that and actually get the 25 percent reduction in, in units right so this is an actual image of the proposed zone this is the latest version i think that we have and it's divided into three parts right initially it was just one big blob but now we have the three blobs and you happen to live i believe in one of these blobs I live in the lower right blob. <laughs> Correct. So the way that's set up is you have the Shrewsbury Commons area, we have a Walnut Street area, and then we have the mandatory mixed use. Now, if you look at the terms from the, the way that the town has set it up, is they're using this in terms of what is the total number of feasibly built units is what they're trying to craft, because that is really going to drive what is the cost to the town? How many of these could possibly be built? So the suggestion is, well, you have 45 acres in Shrewsbury Commons, you have 78 and you have 50, but they're saying there's only 276 units in Shrewsbury Commons, 577 in Walnut, and then the mandatory mixed use just gives you 374 units towards that total capacity. Well, where does that number come from? Well, if you remember, it's 25% of that 1,500 for the mandatory mixed use offset. I so, think also we'd want to show that um, all around this is North Bros zone. Uh, North Bros zone to the far right of that. Uh, and above that, because they basically right. zoned all of their zone in Shrewsbury. It's actually that little, it might be hard to see on the screen, but there's a little D-shaped slot of land, which is where the Econo Lodge sits. Yes. And that is in North Borough's 3A zone, which they did pass. So that will most likely have housing units because of where it is. It is a convenient on and off from 20 and 9, but it is right abutting into our zone. So the one piece I wanted to talk about and put it up here is if you really look at two things, the differentiation between how many units are zoned, how many units could be built. So in zoned, remember, it says 15 units per acre. So I'm showing the math up here that shows it's a lot bigger than that, okay? You're looking at total zoned units of 2,595, right? It's basic math, right? 45 acres times 15 units is 675 and so on. Mandatory mixed use, like we talked about, is it's commercial and residential. So there are units that can be built there. So that is what that total is. Now, underlying that, there's areas we can't build. There's water issues. There could be wetland areas. We get that, right? And there's existing units, right? But just to be clear, it is zoned that for that 2,600, not just 1,500, all right? And from a feasibly built unit standpoint, the town is using this 853 number which we'll show in a little in a bit here that takes 
what we have from Shrewsbury Commons of above existing plus Walnut Street above existing, that's where A53 comes from. But really, my belief is we should actually be adding those 374 because if you think about it, that area where Christmas tree shops is, it's already paved, it's already flat. It'd be very easy for somebody to come in as of right and build a mixed use commercial on the bottom, residential on the top. So there's going to be housing units there. All right. Am I wrong on that? No, absolutely. It's a prime piece of real estate and um, it's generally had a struggle with retail, um, but it won't have a struggle with with uh, with uh, housing plus retail. No, um, that's going to be built on. Right. Um, I think also when you look at the numbers, oh, let me go back here. Sorry. It's OK. Uh, on the Walnut Street side, 577 units to give you an idea. There's over 500. There's less than 577 units, about 550 units at the old Fountainhead which is uh, in Westboro, which right. is called Arrive now. These are very large um, complexes. This is a lot of housing. Um, you know, Edgemere down by Market Basket is only 200 and, 240, 240 yeah. units, and that's giant. Um, so just think of that when you look at these numbers. So the other thing a lot of people have asked us, I think when we were communicating with town meeting members, people say, hey, why haven't we used multiple locations? If you go back and you look at what the town actually presented earlier on, they actually do show that there was multiple uh, options there. And one of them is uh, the Chelmsford property, which is over there, um, Chelmsford Imperial Village is the Shrewsbury Credit Union. So just to let people know, the town guidelines are from the, sorry, the state guidelines show that you can use split zones. You just have to have at least half of what that land needs to be, so the 50 acres, half of it would need to be in a contiguous area. So we would have the ability to split it up because I think there is a concern, like you mentioned, about density, not only with Walnut Street, but Christmas tree shops, Shrewsbury Village, are all right there in the 9 and 20 corridor. So there could be an option, right? We feasibly could do it by splitting it up under multiple spots across town if we so chose. Right, and if you think about the large housing that's going up on Green Street, yep. um, and obviously the one on Route 20, Edgemere, which was just built. Um, there's plenty of places we could have looked to kind of figure this out. I think the town came back and said, well, none of those complied. But how much work did you do to really determine that? Because a lot of towns of our size have done these smaller zones across multiple areas in town because we don't have to be a half a mile from an MBTA station like Westboro does or Grafton does. Right. So we'll see if that's something the town looks at as we move towards the fall if we're, or if we're just going to stick with the proposed plan and, and just work that to the end. So one of the things I really want to dig into here is the numbers, because I think this is important. This is a slide that was presented at the finance committee meeting um, that we actually need to go into here. One of the things, my biggest issue, my biggest challenge is the cost per student, right? So if you look at this, if you look at the total number of school children, the way that they come up with that, we took the 853 units, 0.44 units, or 0.44 children per unit, you get new 375 new students, okay? But the number they show is only $4,500, which is way off. Um, and I'll explain why it's off. You look at when we built Edgemere, there's a consultant that we actually did a fiscal impact analysis of. This was in 2016 numbers. Our costs were $8,405 per student. Because what they do is you take your cost per student that the district gives you less chapter 70 money, okay? That's what that number came down to. So in, in 2016 numbers, 8405, all right? Milton did an impact analysis for their plan and their cost per student was 97.53. The full cost is 14,952 in Milton. If you look at our budget for 2025 that the school committee just prepared and, and presented to the select board, 17,728, okay? So that's what our, and we're touting that is that we're you know very cost effective amongst our peers, 17.7. So if you look at Chapter 70 money, Shrewsbury gets $21 million from the state in Chapter 70 money, okay? So we just divide our Chapter 70 money by a number of students, which is that 5998 number in our enrollment, and we get $3,500 per student in Chapter 70. Take our 17.7 minus that, we get a student incremental cost of 14,201.59. Well, what does that mean? Let's go back to the slide. So our million seven, right, now goes to 5.3 million, okay? And we're only looking at educational costs. We're not looking at uh, police and fire at this time. That translates to the bottom of 5.7 million. So 
we went from a from the town manager standpoint saying, hey, this we always think this will be net positive for the town. I have to disagree. If you look at consultant based costs based off of what towns use and paid consultants to do this type of work, we're losing two point seven million dollars a year. I would argue that the point four four children is wrong too. They've used those numbers a lot based on Edgemere. Edgemere has no three bedroom apartments. It's one and two bedroom apartments. The law, while it doesn't require a specific bedroom size, it does specifically state they have to be family friendly units. When you look at other states that have done this, family friendly generally means two, three, and four bedroom apartments. This number of people coming in, even if we give them that it's less than the 1,500, let's say it's 1,000, it's many more children per, per unit that's coming in here. This is not going to be 0.44. It's not going to be close to 0.44. It's going to be a lot more because these units are going to be marketed specifically to families. Right. But for our analysis here, we'll, we'll go with the town's numbers yeah, and everything let's use the numbers. But I, I definitely agree with you on that. And now on the grant side, I know we are running a little short of time here, but uh, it, it, we're showing it because the key part, like you talk about, is these are over a five-year period and I actually showed this here the five-year average is under a million dollars and if you take out the route 20 edgemere grant which was for the road construction project we're at two hundred and twenty one thousand dollars a year on a budget of 181 million we're talking about 0.12 percent of our budget is grant money not a huge impact right and when you look at the grants that are really up for uh debate most of these grants again when you really dig into them are going towards building more units in town they generally studies to build more things. And if you want to stop building in town, you can say no to these sorts of grants. We might not be eligible to some smaller grants, but there's other ways to fund smaller, smaller initiatives. And so this is actually a smaller impact on us than they want to pitch you. The six million they're showing there, if you can see Green and South Street Connector. I mean, these are just sort of ideas that they're throwing out. And keep in mind, none of these grants are actually guaranteed. They're all discretionary. I, I will give the select board you know, props for, I think, doing the right thing. You know, They did decide that, hey, there is uncertainty among the town meeting members. We think we need to take more time and look at this closer. So we are gonna take a look here at the uh, clip from Beth Cassavant in her speech to the uh, planning board. Um, I just wanna let you all know that I called a select board meeting that was held earlier this evening so that every member of the select board had an opportunity to openly discuss Article 44 and deliberate as a board. Uh, we knew that the timing was important specifically because um, your board is holding a public hearing on all of the articles this evening, including Article 44, which is the MBTA community zoning article. So it's important um, that we as the executive body provide our clear position to the planning board on this critical piece of zoning. Um, the town intentionally solicited community feedback before deciding whether to submit the proposed zoning overlay plan to the state for pre-adoption review. While we have every reason to believe that the proposed plan meets Section 3A requirements, not having feedback from the state leads some people to believe that we are voting on something that may not be compliant. This is a distraction and it doesn't serve town meeting well. It's important to recognize that planning staff worked with our consultant from Central Mass Regional Planning to run our acreage, density, and associated land use through the state's pre-compliance model submitted for approval for the ability to include a mixed use requirement in the zoning and completed an economic development analysis to get approval to allow up to 20% of any units constructed under the proposed zoning to be affordable. Not every community has chosen to go through the pre-adoption process and even if the entire zoning bylaw is submitted for pre-adoption review from the state and deemed acceptable, it's not a guarantee that if it's approved by town meeting, the zoning will be deemed compliant upon final review. Um, as the executive body for the town, we put trust in our town staff to put, in, put us in the best position possible on important matters such as this. And while the select board has no doubt that town staff and the consultant have developed bylaws that reflect community feedback and will be found largely in compliance, not taking advantage of the pre-adoption process to gain feedback from the state is distracting and it's allowed some skepticism and misinformation to crowd out facts and data. So the select board still firmly believes that compliance is the right path for Shrewsbury, but we are willing to wait until the fall special town meeting so that we can go through the pre-adoption process and know for sure um, if we are approved for the mixed use requirement and um, maximum affordability. 
So by waiting, we would further ensure that all interested parties, the select board, the planning board, the finance committee, and most importantly, our town meeting members and our residents that they represent have the best information possible to make this decision in the fall. So the board voted um, unanimously to not recommend adoption of Article 44, the MBTA Community Zoning um, Act compliance at the May 20th, um, 2024 town meeting. Yeah, so that was Beth, right, talking to the planning board. One thing I think is interesting, right, about some of the words, and it goes back to what we were talking about here, is the order in which she listed the reasons, right, why we're doing this. She essentially said that she wanted to ensure that all parties, right, which was the select board first, planning board, finance committee, and then it's most importantly, but, you know, it's the order of operation would be the town meeting members and the residents they represent, right? In, in my mind, you know, I think a very simple way you could refresh it or you could list it would just say, you know, by waiting further, we can ensure that Shrewsbury residents, right, have the best information before a decision is made because every person on those boards is a Shrewsbury resident, right? Absolutely. So why do we have to separate everybody into these categories, right, of select board, planning board? You should just say, we wanna make sure that all Shrewsbury residents have the most information before we make a decision. Yeah, and I think for the town meeting, just to keep in mind, the select board voted to uh, put this off, and so they actually voted no, to, to vote no. The uh, finance committee, I think, is going to vote no. The planning board has to recommend it so that it stays on the ballot for the fall town meeting. But if you're a town meeting member, the town has stated you should vote no, and then we're going to put this um, to a vote later on once they get that plan looked at by the state. So that's all the time we have tonight on the unselects, but we definitely will be back and probably doing a little deeper dive on what happened at town meeting and maybe some other interesting goings on around town. Absolutely. All right, have a good evening, everyone. Thank you.